Good evening. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, we had to turn the chairs around, I'm told, because the lighting is better here for the video. So apologies for any inconvenience, but uh, those who came in last and in the back row, you know what they say, the last shall be first. The first shall be last. In any case, uh, I thank you all very much for coming. This is an extraordinarily important issue, as we have just seen yet again in Boston. Now, it is, there's a great deal of information that's come out about what happened in Boston, and it is very important to note some of the details that should be kept in mind. One of them is that the Russian authorities notified the FBI about Tamerlan Tsarnaev, the older brother, several times, telling him he was meeting with jihadis in Dagestan in the Caucasus, and that he was somebody they should keep an eye on. Not only that, but it has just come out also that this outlandish mother that they have, who says, Allahu Akbar, and I don't care if they kill my other son, they killed this son, and I will just say Allahu Akbar, and she says that they were framed because, of course, America wants to frame Muslims and hates Muslims and all this nonsense. She was on the terror watch list also. And Tamerlan Sarnaev was on the terror watch list, although when the Russian authorities went to the FBI, the FBI essentially did nothing. Now, the angle on this story as a massive failure of American intelligence and law enforcement, I think, has not yet even begun to unfold. And maybe it never will, because there are a lot of people in power who have a lot of reasons to shove it all under the rug. Nonetheless, enough has come out already so that we can know that it was a massive failure of law enforcement and intelligence. Now, why did it happen? Why? did the FBI not keep an eye, not only did they not keep an eye on him, they, they, they were so completely not on the case that he was able to amass the ingredients for these bombs that were made according to the specifications of the Al-Qaeda magazine Inspire, and nobody was paying any attention to this guy on the terror watch list as he gets these bomb materials. No. I think this is the fruit of something that was set in motion several years ago. And unfortunately, part of it has to do with events in which I was actually directly involved. In 2010, I spoke to a military group in Louisville, Kentucky, and I used to give training to military and FBI and to Joint Terrorism Task Force and to various other agencies about Islam and explain to them what it is in Islamic texts and teachings that makes people want to kill people. Because after all, it's the fundamental rule of warfare, know your enemy. And if you don't understand the motives and goals of the people who are trying to kill you, then you can't stop them. But the more you know them, the more you are able to outthink them. And so the U.S. military and the FBI used to bring in me and many other people who work in the same field, and we would do this training. But then, in 2010, I spoke at this, in Louisville at this military base and published a photo on my website, Jihad Watch, of me standing with two of the hosts who were active U.S. military personnel at the time. Now, I did this on purpose because the Council on American-Islamic Relations, which is a Hamas-linked Muslim Brotherhood front group in the United States, had already started to put pressure on the military for bringing in me and others like me to speak. And so, when I got there, the people at the base said, you can't tell anybody you were here. And I thought, wait a minute, is this the United States? Is the U.S. military so afraid of Hamas and the Muslim Brotherhood that they're going to let them dictate who they can bring in and who they can't? And I thought, you know, I just can't go along with that. It was the principle of the thing that if the U.S. military 
on the front lines of protecting this nation, I mean, that's their only purpose, or what ought to be their only purpose, is kowtowing to people who are essentially on the other side, then we're in trouble. And so a couple, these two officers who were among my hosts, they agreed with me, and that's why they posed for the picture, and why we put the picture up. But they did ask that the insignia, their insignia be obscured, and so on. And so I did that. However, on the back wall was the logo of the place itself. <laughs> and we forgot about that. And so the Council on American Islamic Relations complained, and they wrote to the military base in Louisville, they wrote to the uh, Secretary of Defense, they wrote to the head of the FBI, they got a huge coalition, they got Reverend Jesse Jackson to complain, they got all kinds of people to complain because I was training military personnel. And they broadened it out and began a campaign to get all of the training materials that were being used by the FBI and other intelligence agencies and DHS scrubbed of any mention of Islam and Jihad and all the trainers like me be removed. And they did. In 2011, Fatima Hera, who is the head of a Muslim advocacy group in the United States, along with 57 other Muslim organizations, including these Hamas-linked Muslim Brotherhood groups, like the Council on American Islamic Relations, the, the Muslim American Society, the Islamic Society of North America, and others, wrote to John Brennan, who was then the Deputy National Security Advisor, and said, uh, you, you, you've got to cleanse the uh, training materials of all this Islamophobic material. And they specified they said, you've got Spencer in there, and you've got Stephen Coghlan, who is a great man, who was the uh, only authority on Islamic law in the Pentagon for many years, until he was uh, cashiered at the behest of Hisham Islam, the, deputy, the assistant to the Deputy Secretary of Defense. And various other people and various other materials, they listed it all. They said, this has all got to go. It's racist. What racist jihad terror? I always forget and it's bigoted and Islamophobic and hateful and so on. Okay, Brennan wrote back, I think maybe 40 or 50 seconds later, and he said, yes, we're so sorry, yes, we're gonna scrub all this, we're gonna undertake a massive effort, not only are we gonna scrub all this, but we're gonna retrain everybody who was trained by this material or these trainers. And we're gonna make sure that there's nothing about Islam or Jihad in any terror training materials. Now, look, how many non-Muslim terrorists can you really name? <laughs> I, I keep hearing about Timothy McVeigh, and you know, eventually there's got to be an expiration date on that. It's been almost 20 years. And Timothy McVeigh represented no organized movement. There are Islamic jihadis in every continent and pretty much every nation of the world. There are armed Islamic jihads going on against non-Muslims in the Philippines, in Thailand, in Indonesia, in Malaysia, in uh, Burma, in Iraq, in Chechnya, in Nigeria, in Egypt and Syria, and all over the globe. But that's the one terror threat that the, 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 the deputy head of national security and now the CIA director said, we won't talk about Okay, so along comes Tamerlan Tsarnaev. And the Russian authorities say he met with a jihad leader in, in Dagestan. And he met with him six times. And we think this guy is trouble. And he get, they get this in the defanged, politically correct, sanitized, retrained, deprogrammed, or reprogrammed, re-educated FBI, how did they know what to look for? How did they know what the danger signs were? How did they know what on earth to, um, how on earth they could understand what they were even seeing if they looked into this man's activities? They were forbidden to look into anything that would have made it make sense to them. They were not allowed to look into the very things that would have made it all make sense. 
And so, what happened? 